Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's uh, so nice to be with you, and it, we didn't get freezing rain. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a much easier drive here than we expected. But uh, <coughs> we're expecting to have a very interesting day today and tomorrow, and so welcome. Do you want me to push this aside? There we go. It's still singing. So here's, what, here's the plan for the day and the weekend. So this morning I want to give you an introduction to the whole uh, Discover Joy theme. In other words, how to get more. And then this afternoon at 2.30, we're going to talk about uh, mental health problems because we're, we're really what we're going to do is talk about joy stealers. What, what, steals, what can steal your joy? And so we're going to hit uh, uh, several of the major joy stealers in your life. And uh, so this afternoon, we're going to talk about mental health conditions. So I'm, gonna t uh, I'm a mental health guy, so we're going to talk about uh, everything a Christian needs to know about depression, anxiety, and mood swings. And I know some of you are going to say, well, you know, how can you drag that out for an hour? But <coughs> so we'll, we'll pack that all into an hour, and then this evening, we're going to talk about another joy stealer, and that's the whole problem of shame, that, um, that humans are very prone to feeling ashamed, and so that's a big joy stealer. And then tomorrow night, Kathy's going to talk about forgiveness and unforgiveness, because that will rob your joy too. And we've, we've found when Kathy teaches on forgiveness, we've had more people physically healed like just spontaneously, just just out of the blue, they just get healed um, when they when they forgive uh, more than any other session. So that's always a, a, a real interesting adventure to see what happens when we when we forgive. And then uh, Monday morning, uh, Kathy and I are available for personal appointments if you want to have a counseling appointment with us. So if you'd like that, uh, there's just a few spots left. Come and speak to me, and uh, we'll put you in. So um, we're going to start now, and I'm, it's we we I call this. Three steps to discovering joy. Now I'm gonna, uh, this is an, ad an adventure here. I'm controlling the PowerPoint from my phone, which is not always predictable. There we go, okay, so we're working. So am I, am I too close to a monitor or something that it's, it's um, okay, that's good. Now, um, how many of you actually, well actually before I talk about that, we're gonna be doing four sessions of, uh, of joy stealers, but Kathy and I actually have 20. I mean, there's, there's a lot of joy stealers. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> and so if you want to pursue all the other ones, they're on our resource table, okay? So that you can, you can pursue this for you indefinitely. And so you're welcome to do that if you have questions about it. And, uh, and I'll be describing more about how to use our tools and our website uh, as we go along. So um, are, would any of you like to have more joy? <laughs> now, some of you didn't put your hand up, and that's just because you're in denial and you're too ashamed to admit it. But we're talking about that tonight. Okay, the, tonight we're talking about your shame, all right? But uh, or I just assume you've got so much joy you can't stand it. Uh, <laughs> you, you can't stand to have any more. But uh, did you know that you were actually made for joy? It's your factory setting. You know, actually, God actually made you to to have a capacity for joy. But not. But you're born empty, okay? And, there, and there's real easy proof. Have you ever seen a baby born born joyful? <laughs> You see, so you're born without joy. In fact, you're born with anger, and we have a session on anger that we're not doing, okay? Like, um, actually, we found that if we did all 20 sessions in one weekend, you get a new medical condition called toxic mullinism. <laughs> and, that's, and that's when you just overdose, okay? We, so we don't do that. But um, you, you see, you're born without joy, and you're born without love. But then you spend the rest of your life f looking for it. And so that's what Jesus came so that we could have love and joy. Okay, but remember, you're born empty. Now, why do you think God built in the capacity for joy? Well, it's real easy. We were made in his image. He made us in his image. But you know what that means? That means God is joyful. Now, I don't want to rattle your theology, but that just might be a surprise to you. God is actually not angry with you. Let that sink in. He's actually not mad. Because it's, a, you know, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So that means it's coming from him. And so this is all very good news. And did you know, in fact, why do you think Jesus came? Well, I mean, we, you know, Jesus came to save us, and, and that's all true. But Jesus came because God wanted someone, or actually even go back further, why did God create man? He wanted someone to share his joy with, right? He wanted someone to have a relationship with. And so then, so when, when before Adam fell, 
Adam, sh Adam and Eve shared in God's joy. There was no obstruction. But then when Adam fell, he was cut off from God's joy. And then you saw what happened to the whole planet. You know, the, God had to send a flood. It was a real mess. But Jesus came to restore the relationship that Adam forfeited so that we could once again share his joy. So joy and relationship is a huge theme of the Bible. I mean, that's the whole reason Jesus came, was to reestablish the a relationship. And remember, Satan's plan for you is to cut you off from God, from his love, and from his joy. And so even though you may have become a Christian, he wants to make sure you sure never enjoy it. Okay, he may have lost you to his kingdom, but he's going to make sure you stay miserable because then no one will ever want to be like you. And so Jesus wants you to have his joy. In fact, in, 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 uh, in John, in, in John said, whoa, don't want to jump too far ahead. Well, we'll just have to stay with that one. Unless, unless you can back, oh, there, no, yeah, funny, eh? It's just got, there we go. It just it has its own mind. So remember, so this is what Jesus said. I say these things while I'm still in the world so that you may have the full measure of my joy. So that means Jesus had joy he wanted to pass on. Now, I know some people say, I'll, we'll have joy in heaven. We're, it's going to be miserable till we get there. Jesus came so you would have his joy now. Remember, he's talking like present tense. Okay, so he wants us to have his joy now. And then think of this. This is a very powerful verse in Hebrews. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Now, what was the joy set before him? Us. Us. We're the joy set before him. So Jesus died. Jesus came to reestablish a broken relationship so we could actually have his joy on this side of heaven and on the other side of heaven. Well, let that sink in for a while. Okay, you just think now, have you achieved that? Right, so we might have a, a little bit of growing space. And so uh, think of it this way, that when you become a Christian, you enter the kingdom, but then you, so where is this joy and love? And so Satan wants to distract you from the source of joy and love, which is God himself, Jesus. Okay, I mean, God has all the joy and love that you need to overflow, like to fill you in overflow. And Satan says, no, I don't want you to discover that because then you're dangerous. So he distracts us with miserable substitutes counterfeits. So oh, you can, you know, you can have joy if you drive that or you have that or you have that, you know, or you know, he, he distracts us with substitutes, which are counterfeits. So he wants you to never discover the joy that God wants you to have. So that's why we're having this weekend is so you can actually connect properly. You know, you can have a, a great appliance and, and you know, uh, this needs to plug in somewhere. It just doesn't work until it's plugged in correctly. Well, if you're a Christian, and if you want joy and love, then you need to plug in correctly. So that's what we're doing, uh, talking about today. And also to remove the joy stealers in your life, which are devaluing the walk with God that you're supposed to have. Now, you're probably wondering, why, why am I doing this? I mean, I'm a physician, so you, know, you don't, probably don't have a lot of physicians talking to you on Sunday morning. But I'll tell you a little bit about my journey. When I graduated, I actually became an anesthetist. I live in Grimsby, so I, I went to school in Ontario. And so I became a sleep doctor. Now, I just, I just wanted to put people to sleep. <laughs> but not like a vet, okay? <laughs> and so, and so um, people said, you know, why would you want to do that? Because anesthesia isn't a popular specialty. It's sort of eccentric and it's not cool. You know, it's not cool. Uh, it doesn't have its own TV show. <laughs> I mean, imagine what that would be like, eh? If you followed an anesthetist around for a day, like, it'd be sleepy. And so, the, so, so people wondered, well, because I was a Christian, I wanted to find God's perfect will for my life, and I wanted a godly career, you know, like you would. And so I discovered that anesthesia is the most godly of all the medical specialties. So stop laughing. This is a very serious decision, okay? And, and here's the reason. What was God's first medical act? Put Adam to sleep. Well, duh. Okay, so if that was the first thing he did medically, then it's the most important. And then also it's the most like being in the ministry. <laughs> so, so I knew it was a good fit. And, uh, but th there's the other reason, uh, the, the, more, the less uh, spiritual reasons, is anesthesia is all about control. Control of other people. 
okay? And so for a control freak, which is I was at the time, it was perfect fit because you control everything about a person. Like, you know, your blood pressure, heart rate, like all their vital signs, like everything is in your hand. You can control nurses and surgeons, and administrators, like it's fantastic. Like it's a, it's, and there's gadgets, there's tons of gadgets. And I was never good with power tools, so this is a very good substitute for me. And so it was, it, but it, there was even more fun things about anesthesia is it's an immediate gratification specialty because everyone does what they're told. <laughs> you don't have to na negotiate. You know, would you like to go to sleep? Do you really feel sleepy? Would you rather come back a different day? Would, you know, maybe a couple of hours and now you'll be sleepier. And so you don't have to, it just, uh, you've got, if you have a syringe, they are going to obey. <laughs> and, all the, uh, and all the drugs work instantly. You don't have to wait around for a couple weeks. You know, like in, in you know, most drugs, you have to wait, wait, wait. And anesthesia, psh, and it, they're gone. It, it's fabulous. But you know, the best part of anesthesia for me at the time was you don't have to listen to anyone for more than 10 seconds. <laughs> it just, you can be all warm and fuzzy and pastoral and ask all these nice questions. And because, you know, as soon as the syringe is empty, they're quiet. You know, people say, should I count backwards? I, I just don't care. Should I subtract from seven? I just count sheep, count anything you want because in 10 seconds, you're stopped counting. So, so it, it, was, it was perfect for me. The problem was, I live in Grimsby, that's a small hospital, so we only did surgery in the morning. In the afternoons, we all had to be GPs, which, and you can imagine how different general practice is from anesthesia. I mean, nobody does what they're told. The drugs take weeks to work. Uh, it, it's, it was, and you have to listen to people for more than 10 seconds. So I would find after 10 seconds, I would start to drift, unless they were having trouble sleeping. <laughs> well, that's my field. I'd lie down, put up the IV, you will sleep. So, so general practice was awkward. But you know what the most awkward part of general practice was people came to see me with a different kind of pain that I had never uh, been trained in. You see, I knew how to deal with physical pain, and that is you put them to sleep or you put a needle this long into their back between contractions. Mm -hmm. And so that was my range. But people came to see me with a different kind of pain. I didn't know that there was another pain. There was physical pain. You know what the other pain is? Emotional. Emotional. Well, which you think of the two, which you think is the most common? I know it's Sunday morning, but you are allowed to speak out loud, okay? Because I'm, I'm not a reverend, so you can talk out loud. So, so it's emotional, right? And which you think is the most prolonged? Which you think is the most disabling? And which you think is the hardest to treat? Uh, yeah, emotional. Well, I didn't know anything about emotions because the school I went to, you had to have a personality extraction to graduate. <laughs> so that, so that I was, we, we were, they just graduated machines. Uh, to treat machines. So to me, a human was a machine, I was a machine. Like, people came to see me with trouble with their feelings. I thought, feelings? Like, well, one, what are feelings? And two, why, wha what's so important about feelings? You're pink, you're breathing on your own, you have a blood pressure, and you have a pulse. Like, in anesthesia, that's your goal, okay? <laughs> so it's, what's, what do feelings have to do with it? You've, you've got a circulation. And so people came to see me with, with feelings problems, which I had no clue. And most of them were Christians. Well. I didn't know Christians were struggling with all these mental health problems and emotional problems and personal problems. You see, the church I grew up in, everybody was walking in victory. <laughs> everybody. <laughs> Nobody had any of these problems. I, and so I just assumed no one ever talked about it, so I just assumed no one had these problems. Christians just lived this life of total bliss. And so all these people were coming in, so I, I very politely said, I didn't say, I have no idea what you're talking about. I said, uh, oh, why are you coming here? Why not talk to someone in your faith community? And they would, most of them would say, well, that, that would, I would never do that. I'm so ashamed to be struggling with my mood or feelings or marriage. They said, I know I'm the only one. They're all walking in victory. Well, and then I said, well, just sit here in my waiting room for another 30 minutes. You'll see the rest of your church here with the same problem. <laughs> so you, you are definitely not alone. And one lady said, she said, well, she said, I actually did ask someone in the church for help. They didn't know what to do with me. And, and so, um, it's, so she said, so I'm stuck with you. <laughs> that's, that's what she said. I'm stuck with you. So, so I, because I didn't know what to do, but eventually I just. I just felt so bad for all the Christians who didn't know where to turn. They needed to someone who talked their language and had the same worldview. And so I just got, got involved. I got interested, and I started to treat mood disorders, and to my absolute astonishment, people got better. And then word got around, and people came from all over North America, and then it took over my life. I quit 
anesthesia, I quit general practice and I just did mental health for, I don't know, 25 years, something like that. So I had a big mental health clinic. But, so I became very good at un uh, understanding how to diagnose mood disorders and, and from a Christian perspective and how you treat it, which we'll talk about this afternoon. But a few years in, uh, God knew I was a little unbalanced because I knew a lot about the medication side but not the other, other aspects to it. So I admitted one of my very depressed patients to the Grimsby Hospital and so I'm doing my rounds and so I'm, I'm, I'm doing my week, uh, daily uh, interview with her in, uh, in the ward. So I'm sitting beside her bed um, talking to her and in the middle of the conversation her eyes glaze over, a voice comes out of her and says, leave her alone, she's ours. <laughs> well, yeah, what do you do with that? There's no pill for that I found. Okay, now we're into like, this is a different dimension. And so uh, I learned a, wh a whole lot about spiritual warfare, suddenly, abruptly. You see, and we'll talk about more of that this afternoon, but I had no idea that this was possible. And so I had to, get to uh, I, so God sort of took me on a rapid training course in sp spiritual warfare issues, which we'll talk a little bit more this, this afternoon. But that wasn't, good, that wasn't enough in my training program. A few years after that, Kathy and I have a marriage crisis, and we're just falling apart personally, and we uh, have to go to see it. And well, I knew that Kathy needed help, and so, <laughs> so I was willing to go with her to be supportive, to be supportive. And so we went to see this counselor, and he was so helpful, and, and he just trained us, and trained me particularly, because I was the most biggest blockhead, that about, about emotional health. And, uh, and what we learned from him was God wants us to be more than saved. He wants us to be saved and transformed. Well, I knew all about salvation. I didn't know anything about transformation. I thought you just got saved and coasted to heaven. But he actually wants you to become saved and be different. And so that was the key to our marriage. That's why we do marriage ministries is because of what we learned there. And, and you know what that transformation looks like? It looks like a heart transplant or open pit mining. Okay, so God wants to take your scarred, broken, wounded, frozen heart from life experiences and replace it with his heart. And that's the key to your joy. You can't have joy, not easily, with a broken heart, which accumulates to, through your life experience. God actually wants to take that, heal it, replace it with his heart, and then you're going to have a capacity for joy. And so everything we do is about how do you get that heart transplant? And so you do that by removing the, the obstacles, the, the joy stealers. So after we learned this, at the, after these three big milestones in, in my life, then we started to, to teach. So now uh, we do everything online. We have a website which you're welcome to visit any time of the day or night. You won't wake me up or anything. So that's drgrantmullen.com. And so we have got tons of information there on personal growth um, and resources. And there's, there's hundreds of five-minute short videos on personal growth that you can, if you have any trouble with insomnia, you just go in there and start clicking on videos until you're gone, okay? <laughs> but uh, we, we actually have um, a special event coming up uh, tomorrow night here is we're going to have a draw uh, for this video, and this is a DVD I did on, on healing, which is how to pray for the sick, why we should pray for the sick, and stories of people who got healed and we prayed for them unexpectedly. And, uh, and so if you'd like to win this, it, this is actually, it's, it's a draw for anyone who, who wants to sign up for our weekly newsletter. So we send out a free weekly email newsletter with uh, that five minute video. So every week we send out a five minute video on how to think different. And so if you want to subscribe, then fill that out and you'll be entered in the draw, which is tomorrow night, which will be just wild with excitement. And we also do healing weekends. Uh, Kathy and I do healing weekends. We do marriage healing weekends and personal healing weekends based on the stuff that I explained to you that we learned. And so our next marriage healing weekend is in November at a resort in the Dominican Republic. Yes, five days with us. You, you, you will be, you <laughs> well, if you're not changed, at least you'll have fun. Okay, and so, so that, that's the most fun thing we do. We do a, a marriage retreat a, at a resort there. And then we do personal healing weekends every September in Burlington. So uh, you're welcome to come and join us. But when we do um, events like this weekend where we want to help walk people through the transformation journey, we actually uh, want to treat this like a, like a small group. And you know, if you've ever been in a small group or a home group or a 12-step group, you know that you want to make it a safe place to be honest with yourselves. And we're not going to have sharing, but you want to make a place to be honest. But groups like that have rules to make it a safe place. And so most groups have a lot of rules about confidentiality. We, we've boiled it down to one rule just to make it easy. And that is 
Throughout the course of today and tomorrow, we're going to be discussing different kinds, well, describing different kinds of personality styles, relationship styles, thinking patterns, and we might actually be describing exactly the person you're sitting beside, <laughs> which can be really awkward. So we have one w rule. It doesn't matter how accurately and specifically I'm describing that person, there is to be <coughs> no nudging, okay? This is, this is strictly enforced. Okay? Doesn't matter. So throughout the course of all our sessions, you, do, you don't say, that's your problem, that's you. Okay? This is especially a big deal in our marriage events. Okay? We're very strict about that in marriage events. But here's what you do. If, if, if when I am describing the person you're with, you catch my eye and you're not in a very pastoral way. <laughs> yes, and I'll know what you mean. Okay? I'll, I'll know what you mean. Okay? So, um, what we want to, what I want to explain to you that the key verse to get rid of your joy stealers, the key verse in your, in your transformation is this, Romans 12 and 2. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. And how do you be transformed? By the renewing of your mind, which means change how you think. Okay, change how you think. Because remember, your relationships, your emotions, your joy, everything is dependent on how you think. And so if you're thinking in a, in a pattern, in a, in a, if you've gotten into a, a thinking rut that just prevents you from having the joy that God wants for you, you have to change that if you want to actually open up a whole new way of, of living, okay? So um, when I was, I was growing up in the church, I heard this verse quoted a lot. And it's a really important verse, but no one ever told me how to do it. They just sort of left me on my own, you know, read the Bible and pray more. So I opened up to Leviticus, and I go, this, this is not giving me joy, this is not transforming my mind, okay? So, uh, it's, so then I went to Numbers, and it just, I didn't get any, I was good count, but I didn't have any <laughs> revelation. So I want to give you a very easy to understand model of how to change the way you think, which, and the biggest joy stealers in your life, okay? And so, um, so the Bible says that there are three parts to humans. Okay, body, soul, and spirit. But your soul is your, actually your personality. So your personality is your mind, will, and emotions. So these are the, th the three parts of humans. And so your body is your physical self that relates to the planet through your five senses. It's your temporary container. Your spirit is your eternal self that relates to the invisible realm, the kingdom of light or darkness, you, you choose. But your soul or personality is your horizontal relationships. Okay, so that's uh, mind, will, and emotions, but that's how you relate to other people. Now, your personality is shaped by two things, primarily. And that is the events of your past, but more important than the events, the conclusions that you made about those events or how you interpreted those events, okay? Remember, the interpretation is far more important than the event because you can have two people have the identical experience with very, very different interpretations that change which would affect their life. And the easiest example of that, actually, is the 12 spies who went into Canaan. Ten came back with a very, very different interpretation than the other two, and it changed the course of both of their lives and the whole nation, okay? So, so, that, so that it's your interpretation that's more important than what actually happened. Now, those two things, your, your personal events, history, and your interpretation are stored in what we call your emotional baggage. So whenever we talk about baggage, and Kathy and I talk about that constantly, that that's what we're referring to, the events and your conclusions, because that shapes your self-esteem, self-image, self-confidence. It's all based on your interpretation. Now, your baggage can be small or big depending on what you've lived through. You know, there's a lot of space between your ears. And so that d if you've had a really painful past, you can have a pretty big baggage. Now, let's think of this particular person. He's, he's about to become a Christian, but he's really messed up, right? He's got terrible past, terrible baggage, terrible relationships. He just thinks negatively. Like, he, uh, How much does he have to improve to qualify for salvation? Yeah, none, because salvation is a search and rescue operation, right? Jesus comes to rescue us when we're at our worst. So he qualifies. So he says this in his prayer. What happens to his three parts, body, personality, and spirit? What happens to his three parts the moment after he says this in his prayer? Well, what happens to his spirit? Changes ownership, right? Comes into the kingdom. Complete. The legal transaction, he moves completely into the kingdom. Okay? He's totally saved. Okay? What happens to his body at the moment of salvation? What happens to yours? Nothing. Now, we do get a new body later. And no one's in a big rush to get it, I've noticed. 
But what happens to his personality or his baggage the moment after salvation? Okay, he's, you know, it's pretty damaged. What happens to that the moment after salvation? Well, he becomes a Christian now, a Christian with baggage. Does baggage automatically disappear at the moment of salvation? Or does your personality instantly change at the moment of salvation? No. So you become a Christian with baggage. Then when I was growing up, we just wrapped Christian clothes around our baggage and learned Christian jargon and pretended it wasn't there. And we just agreed we wouldn't talk about it because it was, you know, nothing you can do about it, so don't talk about it. But if you've never addressed your baggage issues, you don't look like that. You look, well, actually, you look like this, okay? Because people ask me, but I don't have any baggage. Oh, guys ask me this. I don't have any baggage. What are you talking about, baggage? And I said, well, do you ever overreact to anything ever? <laughs> In other words, are you ever like that, okay? If you've ever overreacted to anything ever, you've got baggage, okay? So if you haven't dealt with your baggage, you don't look like the guy I just showed you. You look like this. Now, do you think this guy's walking in victory? Do you think this guy's overflowing with joy? No. But what, does he know the truth? Well, does he have access to the truth? Yes. Does he know how to use it? Probably not. Does he have spiritual armor? Well, yes, but does he know how to use it? No. Is he trying really hard? Well, yeah, he's pulling himself up by his own bootstraps. But, but, you know, but does he have that look that, I think there's something wrong. There's something wrong. With, like, you know, when I became a Christian, they promised it would all be peace, love, joy, and veggie tales. And this is not what I'm experiencing, okay? So what's holding him back? Why is he not experiencing joy and victory? What's holding him back? What's weighing him down? His baggage, that's right. Now, do you think that's, uh, do you think he's a powerful evangelistic force? No. Do you think Satan's intimidated by a Christian who looks like that? Yes. No. And uh, what percentage of Christians look like that? Now, it's a big, I know it's not a problem here, but in Grimsby, it's a big problem, okay? <laughs> we have a lot of Christians looking like that. I know you're fine, but, but would you say quite a few Christians look like that? Yes, definitely. And so that's why we're living joyless lives. We're, we're underneath the weight of our baggage, but that's, is that God's will? No, whose will is it? Satan's will, because he wants you to be so miserable. Be there's actually, can you imagine how his, this man's life would change if he got rid of his baggage, knew how to use the word of God, knew how to use his spiritual armor, and started to walk in his gifts, his calling, his anointing, and in the power of the Holy Spirit? Do you think that would change his life? Do you think that would change his marriage? Do you think that would change his work? Do you think he would discover joy? Yes. And so there's nothing scarier to Satan than a Christian who's walking free of their baggage and their gifts, callings, and anointing the power of the Holy Spirit because then we're dangerous. So as long as he can keep a Christian looking like that, we are no threat to him at all. So that's why so many Christians look like that is because Satan wants you to stay that way. Now, if that's not God's will, why is it so common? Why is that the majority not the exception? Because, it, I mean, there's something wrong with this picture. Well, you know the number one reason why people haven't dealt with their baggage? Because we don't talk about it. Who talks about baggage? We're all fine, eh? We're all walking in victory. Well, that, of course, is a lie. But th the main reason is we don't talk about it. You can't be healed of a problem you never are aware of or discuss. So Satan makes sure we never talk about it. And the, the next reason is that some people think that there's nothing they can do about their baggage. It's their cross to bear. Lots of people just say, well, that, uh, those are just the cards I was dealt. I just had a terrible upbringing, and there's nothing I can do about that. I'm just wounded and scarred and defective, and nothing will ever change, and I'll have to wait to get to heaven. Well, that's a lie, So, because that's not God's plan. When you come into the kingdom, you can start the most exciting, transforming experience of your life. Okay? But you know the third reason? Well, actually, there's probably lots of reasons, but the third that, that, are, that are big in my mind is that the process of getting rid of your baggage is voluntary. You don't have to do it. Like, this is not a salvation issue. This is just a personal freedom issue. In other words, do you want joy or not? You know, you can, you can stay, you know, if your comfort zone, a lot of people say, well, joyless is my, they don't use these words, joyless is my comfort zone. <laughs> you know, this is my personal tradition. I come from a joyless family. We've all been joyless, and we're all going to stay joyless because if anyone got joyful, we, they would stick out. They wouldn't fit in at Christmas dinner when we're all complaining. <laughs> and so th th this is just this is our expectation. You know, we're just complainers all the time. And so, so some people would say, this is, this is where I'm comfortable. S transformation is voluntary. You don't have to do it. 
So I like to look at, I think in my mind, I think the kingdom of God is like a walled city with a single entrance, which is Jesus himself. That's the only way in. But when you enter the kingdom in my picture, it's as if you're given two possible pathways. And one is the pathway of transformation where you allow God to get rid of your baggage, which is that picture, okay? So that's when you give him permission. And then you can start to move to a joy-filled life. Or you can take a much shorter and much more popular route, and that is to just take two steps into the kingdom and huddle with all your friends and be bitter, angry, resentful, unhappy, fearful, terribly dysfunctional, absolutely joyless, and totally saved. <laughs> and you can join all your friends clutching tightly to their baggage, saying, this is just the way it is, okay? This, you know, yesterday, today, forever the same, okay? I will not be moved. That's your favorite song. <laughs> and so, and so, and that group is a whole lot bigger, and I know that group well. I was in that group until we had a marriage crisis. I, know, I knew that well. So Jesus doesn't want you to stay there. Satan does, because that's a joyless, minimalist existence. That's not, the, not, not, that's not your inheritance, okay? So how do you move from that stuck group into the transformation group? Okay, so this is the key to joy. Well, we go back to the three parts of humans because there are huge joy stealers in all those three parts that will keep you in that zone, okay? And so let's look at those three parts. There are physical conditions, spiritual conditions, and emotional conditions that will steal your joy and keep you paralyzed, okay? So in the physical realm, anything that affects how you think is going to affect your level of joy and freedom. So. All three of these areas affect how you think, feel, and relate to others. So if you have a mental health problem, which we'll talk about after lunch, then that will steal your joy because that interferes with thought control. So th those are physical conditions. But in the spirit realm, in case you weren't aware, Satan hates your guts. He will do anything to prevent you from improving in any way. He doesn't want you in the kingdom, but once he loses you into the God's kingdom, he wants you to be paralyzed with joylessness so that you never accomplish anything. So he wants to harass you. Then in the third area, if you have a very painful past and you have a lot of baggage, well, you're, gonna, you're going to need a little bit of more help to resolve that than someone who doesn't have as much baggage. But Satan wants these obstacles to be so huge and so intimidating that you give up. He just wants you to say, oh, I'll never be able to deal with that. Well, here's good news. You are not intended to deal with those issues by yourself because they are, they're big. And so Satan wants to say, well, you know, it's just too big. You can't do it. And Jesus is saying, of course you can't do it. Ask me for help. Okay, because Jesus has to help you in all three of those areas. And that's why I want to tell you about it. So that instead of um, sinking under the weight of this, you'll say, well, Jesus, actually, I need your help. Okay. So actually, when I wrote the book Emotionally Free, uh, which is out there, uh, I actually just divide the book into those three areas. The first third of the book is how to do an assessment of the physical issues that might be stealing your joy and the mental health problem. The second third is how to deal with spiritual warfare, on, on, so how to push Satan out of your life, out of your head. And then the third is how to do an inventory of your personality to see where your baggage is. So that's sort of our textbook. But in the physical realm, which we'll talk about uh, this afternoon specifically, mood disorders, depression, anxiety, and bipolar, these are disorders of thought control. And so if you lose thought control, it's going to be very hard to control your mood or to have joy. Or it's, 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 a, it's a big obstacle. And another way of looking at it is a mood disorder is like blurred thinking compared to blurred vision. Well, if you have blurred vision, you wear glasses. And blurred thinking, there are medicines to clear up your thoughts, to give you a clear mind. Or here's another way of looking at it. If you wear glasses to read your Bible, and you take your glasses off, do you notice that your Bible becomes strangely silent? And then you put your glasses back on, and the Bible speaks again. But what happened when you put your glasses back on? Was it, did you have a deliverance experience, or you got saved again? What, how come the Bible spoke again? You could see the words. Okay, now in medicine, we have actually a, a, a there's a term in medicine we use for the process of putting your glasses back on, and, and you can see. And we call that common sense. Okay, so common sense says if you need glasses, put them on, okay? And in mental health, if you need medicines to give you clear thinking, take them. Okay, so we'll talk about that all in um, this afternoon, okay? But now, the, the, the area of personality baggage is the biggest one because that affects all of us. And here's how, this is what baggage looks like if you take the lid off, okay? So if you unscrew the lid to look what's inside your baggage, so remember, your baggage is a collection of your events and the conclusions that you made about those events. So here's actually what happens. 
when this is how Satan attacks people. He loves to attack children because right, children are the most vulnerable. And so he, he just loves to damage your personality. And here's how he does it. He creates significant wounding events, painful wounding events in your life because we've all had them. And so at the time of a significant emotional injury, it's like having an earthquake of your personality and the pillars of trust that held your personality up collapse. And, and it's like your personality becomes like wet cement, very impressionable. Okay, because you're, you're shaken because you're thinking, what happened? Why did that happen? Like, whose fault was that? You can't make any sense out of it, especially when you're little. So Satan knows how vulnerable you are at that moment. So in that moment of vulnerability, he comes along and whispers into your mind the conclusions he wants you to make about what just happened or the interpretation he wants you to make about that event. And if there's no one there giving you the correct interpretation, you're going to accept his because you don't really have a better one. So you can say, well, I guess it was my fault. I guess no one will ever love me. I guess I won't amount to anything. I guess I really am a loser. You know, all kinds of horrible things you believe about yourself that just crush your spirit. And, and if there's no one there to tell you what really happened, that you'll say, yeah, I guess, you know, I guess I'm just a loser, okay? And so it's the, here's the problem. As soon as you accept and believe his lie, you have now given it power over you. Well, that's a big deal. If you give Satan's lie power over you, and then it becomes a stronghold in your life. A stronghold is just a pattern of thinking based on a lie. And what happens is all these lies that you believe and the painful memories they get stored in your baggage. And so your bag fills up with the pain, but more importantly, the conclusions or the strongholds. Now, these strongholds are not silent. They're not just, oh, well, that's just historical. You know, when I was six, I believed I was a loser. No. Strongholds are like radio broadcasting stations that continuously broadcast into your mind and remind you of all the lies that you've accumulated. So even though years later, you know, when you're an adult, you're a successful adult, in the back of your mind, you still are hearing that lie. You're a loser, you'll never amount to anyone, no, no one will ever love you. All the stuff that is, is stored there. And so that's why your baggage is so dangerous, is because that's Satan's playground. Because if you have strongholds, if you have lies that you've committed, he's got ammunition, he'll just keep reminding you and throwing it at you. And so the key to your healing is to empty your baggage. Because see, as long as you're carrying that, how much joy are you gonna have? As soon as you have a little flicker of joy, He'll just pound it with a, no, remember what happened? Just to extinguish that little spark. And so that's why it's so important to, get, to empty your baggage. And emptying your baggage, though, you need supernatural help. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to forget all that. That never works, okay? You need supernatural help. So this is in Hebrews 4 and 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It really what that means is the only way to get rid of your baggage is the truth of the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's good news. Okay, remember, you can't address your baggage alone. You need supernatural help. Now, in the spirit realm, remember, Satan wants to uh, fill your mind with his thoughts. So he wants to influence how you think. So he wants to magnify every bad habit you have. He wants to magnify every uh, negative emotion, negative thinking. He just wants to take anything that's negative in your life and <laughs> expand it to make sure that you are joyless. Okay, so remember, we're talking about all these joy stealers. There's physical issues that are joy stealers, baggage is a joy stealer, and then just the direct attack of Satan on your mind is a joy stealer. But his number one way of attacking you is through your baggage. Because he knows what will get you upset. And that's to remind you of all the things that happened that were true historical events. And remember what a loser you are? You know, yeah. Okay, so that's why getting rid of your baggage disarms him. And if you learn how to do that, you can actually be free. Because we have spiritual authority, which we'll talk about this afternoon more, that you have spiritual authority to actually stop him. But he doesn't want you to know that, of course, because if you knew that, you'd use it. And so he doesn't want you to know that. And so here is the key to unloading your baggage. And this is actually the key to Romans 12 and 2. Remember I said r no one ever told me how to actually do Romans 12 and 2? Well, here it is. It's, here's the key to Romans 12 and 2. How to change the way you think. Just wa walk through this verse. For though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. What's a stronghold? A pattern of thinking based on a lie stored in your baggage. They'll steal your joy. We demolish arguments and every pretension, so those are lies that you've been believing, 
that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So taking captive every thought is the same as being transformed by a renewing of your mind. So how do you do that? You just work backwards through the verse. If you want to take captive every thought, you have to demolish strongholds. Well, a stronghold is a pattern of thinking based on a lie. So in your baggage. So how do you demolish a stronghold? Using weapons not of this world. Well, the weapons not of this world, the nuclear weapons not of this world is our repentance and forgiveness. So that's why we're talking about forgiveness tonight, because that's a nuclear weapon to empty your baggage. But those are the two, forgiveness, forgiveness and repentance. Those are the two nuclear weapons. So when you learn how to use forgiveness and repentance, you can actually demolish the stronghold. And when you've demolished the stronghold, it, it ends the attack, and then you can take every thought captive because it's clear. It's clear. That's good news. Okay? It's clear. Okay? And when you do that, this is what actually happens in the spirit realm. If you wondered what happens when you pray like that, repenting and forgiving, it's nuclear. Okay? And this is actually, this is, this is my favorite verse. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 20. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. You can't talk someone out of baggage or any of these things we're talking about. You need the Holy Spirit's power. And the wonderful thing is, Jesus is actually here in this room right now saying, can I help you? Will you let me? He waits for our permission. Satan says, no, you're fine. You're fine. This is your family tradition to be miserable, and you'll always be miserable. There's nothing you can do about it, but just, you know, you've gotten used to it. Why rock the boat, you know? Because I'm sure it'll make lunch late or something. And so, but Jesus is saying, if you give me permission, I want to set you free. Now, as I was growing up, I mean, uh, I was in denial. Nothing ever changed. But I did observe a few people over decades, their baggage would get gradually less. And so I call that the ox cart transformation. Now, it's better than denial. I was always in denial. But that they, so they were improving, but it just took years. And what God showed us, especially after we went through our marriage healing journey, what God gave me a picture that he was coming up alongside us now in a different vehicle. And Jesus is actually saying to each one of us, is, do you want to speed this up? <laughs> Would you like to have my joy on this side of heaven? Would you actually like to start having my joy now? Or would you like to get rid of your baggage now? It doesn't have to be a lifetime process. We can actually speed this up if you'll let me. Because remember, you, this is not a salvation issue. You can stay the way you are forever and still go to heaven. It's just a matter of, did you want to crawl there? Or did you actually want to, to live in the freedom and the joy that Jesus came for you to have? Remember, he came that you're to have life and more abundantly. Okay, he, Jesus came to set you free. So the question is, do you want to be set free? And you need to take your baggage to the cross. And you need to give God permission to start to show you where your baggage is, what happened, what were the lies you believed, and to actually start to use repenting and forgiveness and perhaps see a counselor. Because a counselor can walk you through the process of what do I repent for, what do I forgive. In other words, recognize you have a problem and go and talk to a Christian counselor to actually start resolving that. Like, why stay stuck? You don't have to. So this is the key to joy. To discover joy, you need a healthy mind. We'll talk about how to do that this afternoon, how to assess yourself, how to assess your mental function. You need, a healthy, you need healthy emotions. That means get rid of your baggage. And you need a healthy spirit. In other words, you need a close, ongoing walk with God so you can actually hear his voice and he can point out things that need to be healed. This is good news. This is good news. So he waits for your permission. So would you like to give him permission? 